Wow. What an incredible story. I have must have seen that film hundreds of times, but that story is a piece of Americana. Hi, I'm Travis Mitchell, Senior Vice President and Chief Content Officer for Maryland Public Television. And I happen to have been one of the executive producers of Shaw Rising. You see, I was born on the campus of Shaw University. I was reared on that campus. My father was a graduate. He was a all conference basketball player and later a very young basketball coach there. My aunt worked in administration. My uncle was on the board of trustees and my mother was a graduate there. Uh, I could not have imagined a better place to grow up. It indeed was my Wakanda before Black Panther. And so I am just pleased uh, that you had an opportunity to witness um, a great piece of filmmaking. Um, I am thrilled to be joined by one of my most favorite people in the world, the president of Shaw University, Dr. Paulette Dillard, the 18th president of Shaw U. Uh, Dr. Dillard, thank you for joining us tonight. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in and joining us for a conversation for change as we engage in this very important discussion about HBCUs. Welcome, Dr. Dillard. Thank you, Travis. It is such a privilege to be here. Uh, and so great to see you. We miss you in North Carolina, but glad for this opportunity uh, to further share the Shaw story. Well, I, I understand that before we get into our discussion, I understand that this is a very special day, a very special uh, occasion for Shaw University. You want to share what it is for us? Uh, actually, Shaw University is celebrating its 155th birthday. Wow. Uh, and, uh, and that is an amazing accomplishment uh, when you think about um, 1865, as, as was depicted in the documentary, you know, the end of the, the fall of the Confederacy, and then out comes, you know, this institution. And 155 years later, it is still on mission. Uh, yes. And so we are so excited um, to share our story uh, and to have um, uh, more people know uh, the Shaw story because we believe it is an incredible story. And as you're saying that, you know, I, I think of a mix of, of several hymns, you know, from the civil rights era. We, we've come this far by faith, but we ain't going to let nobody turn us around. You know, Shaw uh, is so emblematic of the resilience in our people. But be before we get into a little bit more about Shaw, uh, let's talk a little bit about your uh, academic uh, journey. You are a native of North Carolina. You are a three time HBCU graduate. So what can you tell us? Uh, about your educational journey and, and how your uh, HBCU experience has shaped your life? Um, I, I'll do that. But before I do that, uh, Travis, I do want to thank um, the A.J. Fletcher Foundation, um, you, Hal Goodtree, and all of those responsible uh, for making Shaw Rising happen. Uh, and before I tell my story, I just have to acknowledge publicly uh, the, the great support that we, uh, we received in order to make Shaw Rising a reality. Uh, for a period there, it was just a, a dream and a desire. And so I want to acknowledge all the support we received uh, to make it happen. Well, well thank um, you so much. <laughs> Uh, my journey is much like the students that attend most HBCUs. I am a first-generation college student, the first in my family to, uh, to get a, a college degree. And so I came out of rural North Carolina. Um, and the only thing I knew about college was that my teachers said, you need to go to college. Uh, and so, you know, I was uh, excited uh, to have that opportunity, um, but was not necessarily very well prepared uh, for what uh, college would be like, having not had anyone in the family 
uh, to steer uh, through that journey. Mm -hmm. Now, education has always been important in my household. You know, my, my mother and father were keen that you will go to school, you will do your homework, um, and you will graduate from high school, and you will continue uh, because in education, um, like in most uh, Black households, was the key. Um, uh, even in the year that I graduated, not just 155 years ago. And so um, I began my, my, um, my journey at um, uh, Barber Scotia College in, in Concord, North Carolina. Uh, it is one of the HBCUs that has not survived, uh, but uh, its graduates have survived and gone on to make a difference in um, in the in the nation and in the lives of other other folks, um, and so uh, uh, my experience at Barbara Scotia was just so enriching, you know that you know I wanted you know I wanted I wanted more, and so uh, graduating from Barbara Scotia uh, with a degree in biological sciences, um, I trained to become a, a, a medical technologist, worked in. Um, diagnostic medicine, I always wanted to be a scientist. Um, and from there, um, I was able to get a master's from uh, Tennessee State University um, and went on to, to work in diagnostic medicine and research for um, uh, um, almost 25 years before completing my doctorate and returning to academia. So uh, it's been um, a journey of curiosity, but I think the most striking thing about my journey has been the number of, of, of influencers and encouragers along the way. And I do not believe that I would have had that same opportunity um, had I been a number at, you know, a, a, a PWI, mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. not only was I taught content, mm -hmm. um, I was taught, you know, how to be confident and, and how to believe that, you know, you could achieve, um, all you had to do was, was have the determination and have some folks in your corner. And, you know, I can name a lot of folks. I can remember my freshman convocation. I can remember uh, that speech that Mabel Parker McLean made, you know, and, you know, and, 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 and to this day. And so I, you know, I give um, all the accolades to, you know, my three time HBCU uh, experience, because all along the way, I've always been told you can do it. You know, you have everything you need. We've prepared you now go do it. And, I didn't, you know, I didn't think anything else. And so, you know, so I was able to, uh, to, to really have, you know, an incredible uh, career, incredible opportunities because so many people believed in me, you know, uh, in each of those HBCUs. That, that's incredible. Uh, before we move on, Dr. Dillard, to another question, let, let's unpack a few things that you said. Uh, and I want to encourage those who have joined us and who are with us online to go ahead and send the questions in by chat because we want to hear from you and we want to give you a chance to speak with one of America's greatest education leaders and, and pick her brain and ask her some direct questions. Uh, but Dr. Dillard, you mentioned of your three-time HBCU experience. Uh, I talked to one of your students uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. I heard an interview with one of your students, as a matter of fact, your SGA president, Mr. Finley. And he was saying that what he thought was special about Shaw, he mentioned you. He, he talked about being on campus and having the president walk up and have a conversation with you and really a, a very encouraging and, and, and very nurturing. So do you think that the secret sauce of HBCUs is that nurturing environment? You mentioned being more than a number, but can, can you talk about the importance of creating a nurturing environment and what that does to prepare student leaders? Uh, uh, great question, Travis. Uh, one, of the, one of the incredible things about HBCUs um, you know, is that you do know the individual student. 
Mm -hmm. um, and you know that you have a responsibility to the whole student. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can't deal with how they're performing in a course without dealing with the other things that are going on, you know, with, with, with that student. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we have that opportunity on HBCU campuses. Um, and, you know, um, it, it may sound strange to others, but, but you learn body language and you learn, you know, a look um, mm -hmm. and you don't think twice about stopping someone and say, you know, is everything OK? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, students are startled by that. Yeah. You know, that someone stops and says, is everything OK? Yeah. Somebody you know, cares. Yeah. 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 You, you, you want to talk about it? Yeah. You know? And, you know, and or, you know, uh, or I was I was walking across campus one day um, and a student said to another student, uh, that's the president. Ask her. And <laughs> and the other student said, I can't ask the president. He said, yes, you can. You can ask Dr. Dillon. And, and, you know, and, and so it's it, it's that kind of, you know, of of. Um, stop and, you know, take an interest that happens at HBCUs. Um, and, you know, and we, we speak a language that, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes, um, you know, is, is, you know, is, is, is different in that, you know, I recognize what you're not saying. Yes. You know, yes. and, um, and I'm going to correct you if you're, if, if you're, uh, your grammar is not correct. Mm -hmm. I'm going to correct mm -hmm. you if if what you're telling me is not factual, mm -hmm. but I'm going to do it after I find out what exactly is your issue, because I want to deal with that first. Mm -hmm. And then I have an opportunity to teach. And yes. I think that's the secret sauce. Deal yes. with my me issue. Then I'm granted the opportunity to teach you. Uh, and I can't teach you if I can't relate, um, you know, to you. And I wow. think that that's the HBCU secret sauce. I can wow. relate to you. Now I can help you learn. Wow. So you affirm, confirm and create a safe space to challenge. Uh, that Absolutely. is fantastic. That is fantastic. You know, we we just watched a whole hour about Shaw's 150 years at that time, a little bit more. Um, and it ends with your inauguration as the 18th president. So so we know what the past looks like. Now, you, you've been at Shaw in an official as the official president uh, beyond your interim period now for a little over 18 months. Is that correct? Um, yeah, actually, yeah, I've, I've been, um, you know, two years. Two years. OK, uh, two so, years uh, because my inauguration came months after after my, your uh, after uh, the announcement. Commitment. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But that's, that's so, OK. So, so two years. And so we, we've seen the past and, and we got a glimpse in the film. You had just been inaugurated. We heard from you. What what does the future look like? What What's your vision for Shaw for the future? Oh, wow. I um, hope you got a lot of time uh, <laughs> because uh, yeah, I have a big vision um, mm -hmm. uh, for Shaw, um, uh, building on its incredible past. And that is Shaw sits in vibrant downtown Raleigh, North Carolina, mm -hmm. one of the fastest growing um, regions in the nation. Um, it ha it boasts the Research Triangle Park. It boasts um, um, uh, technology companies. It boasts uh, uh, the largest research one um, um, university, you know, in 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 the nation in in NC State. Um, and so Shaw is sitting in a city that is 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 growing by leaps and bounds and investment is coming you know left and right but there's one aspect of raleigh that has not achieved um at the level of its many other accolades mm -hmm. and that is diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. um and so in 
in in Raleigh, North Carolina, there is the need for this treasure called Shaw University. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is to partner with these incredible companies mm -hmm. to be the pipeline of students so that the president of Wells Fargo are, uh, never has to say, I can't find mm -hmm. black talent. Yeah. It's not that I can't hire them. I can't find them. Mm -hmm. So my vision for Shaw is I'm going to remove that excuse from any organization that wants to have diverse talent. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to invite them into Shaw, help us de develop the curriculum, train the students to be what you say you need, mm -hmm. because they're able, they're capable, and we can train them. We've been doing it for 155 years. Yeah. So now we're saying we're ready to partner with you, yes. you know. We have the secret sauce mm -hmm. that provides you what you need to get to that um, equity inclusion metrics that you speak about wanting to move that needle. And I'm happy to report that the city of Raleigh has been very receptive um, and we're beginning to see how Shaw becomes a integral part of the city uh, today in 2020 and beyond, uh, not as part of its heritage trail, because for quite a while it was, you know, you can go over and see the beautiful buildings from 1873, five of which are on the National uh, Registry of, of Historic Places. Well, that's our past. Yes. Our future is you can sit in historic Estee Hall, look out across the Raleigh skyline and see Red Hat um, and see uh, First National Bank and see um, uh, uh, Wells Fargo. Um, and, you know, you see the growth of the next Central Park in what's happening with Dick's Park. And so you can't grow Raleigh lest you come through Shaw. Right. And so our time has come mm -hmm. to once again be an incredible contributor, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to the space in which we exist. Mm -hmm. And so we have been forging incredible partnerships um, and we believe that Shaw can be and will be the answer to uh, the the diverse talent need uh, that is 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 in our area and um, and for those of you not familiar with it, um, North Carolina has a goal, my future NC, that by 2030 we need at least two million adults ages 25 to 44 with a high quality. Uh, credential or post-secondary degree. Um, and at the rate that we are going now, we're gonna be um, 400,000 plus um, individuals short of that goal. Mm -hmm. And the goal is gonna be even greater for um, underrepresented populations. Mm -hmm. And so we believe that there is Shaw's new niche. Shaw, along with the other HBCUs in North Carolina, have an incredible role to play. And because uh, Shaw sits in the capital city, we believe that uh, we have found what is our path forward. So we are busy um, uh, building uh, the programs that we have aligned with the growth sectors in the city. Um, and I am very optimistic about Shaw's future. Now, I'm not saying we don't have challenges. Right. Now. right I, you know, don't, right. Don't, yeah, we, we haven't made it by any means. Right. But I certainly see a clear path forward for Shaw University. 
So, so in your answer, I, I think it leads to uh, my next question: uh, What makes y'all so uh, special and unique? Uh, but in before you answer that, I, I want to tie back to something you said uh, in your comments here uh, just now, and, and that is the you made a your value proposition is that Raleigh, the economy of Raleigh, Raleigh cannot, and North Carolina as a whole, cannot be competitive if it doesn't develop the human resources, the potential of the future labor force. And so Absolutely. if you don't have the skilled workers, we're now kind of going back to HBCUs being seen as because of what HBCUs do so well, harvesting, meeting students where they are, which you mentioned, harvesting the leadership out of them and taking them to a whole nother level that they may not have thought was possible. And we have to keep in mind that it's a misnomer that HBCUs don't continue to attract the best and brightest students. You have the best and brightest, but you also have a mix of students who need an opportunity and some encouragement. So then if you are helping provide an answer to a problem that the state has, and indeed HBCUs that the problem that the nation has in developing the future workforce, then in your secret sauce you mentioned, what makes Shaw in this greater equation so unique? Uh, what makes Shaw so unique is, um, you know, if I were a real estate agent, you know, it would make sense. Location, location, mm -hmm. location. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, I'm uniquely, you know, located. I mean, um, my students can walk to these uh, learning experiences. They can intern. You know, they can, you know, they can hop on, you know, transportation you know, knows and go, you know, you know, wherever. Shaw is part of uh, the cooperating Raleigh Colleges uh, uh, consortium. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so we, we, we've created kind of a, an environment where um, we get to expose others in our community to that secret sauce. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in, 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 in a way that doesn't seem to be um, combative, but more um, engaging. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. we have a, 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 a history that draws people to Shaw. Mm -hmm. And if you're in North Carolina, you cannot go to any rural county and not know someone who graduated from Shaw, who is either the sheriff, the principal, um, or, or, or some government official you know, in the city. And so Shaw uniquely has locations outside of its main campus, you know, located in other cities that give, um, um, uh, returning adults an opportunity to get a degree that, you know, they started many years ago, uh, but wanted to remain in their communities. And so the footprint of Shaw makes it, you know, somewhat unique. Shaw was doing um, adult education from satellite campuses long before it, um, it existed yeah. as, you know, as, 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 as a sector. Yeah. And so, you know, I, you know, I, I, I just know that Shaw is special because it seems to always um, uh, uh, look out on the horizon and address a need um, that is immediate. And the, the issue that Shaw has that many HBCUs have is that we have been significantly under-resourced. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so now we're looking at ways to address being under-resourced. Mm -hmm. And we are addressing it um, in terms of an investment mm -hmm. that if the growing economy in Raleigh and city government invest in Shaw, we will give you the return in terms of the well-educated, well-trained workforce that tends to stay in North Carolina 
where you know you know over 60 percent of our student population you know happens to be north carolinians wow. and so 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 we believe that um we are positioning ourselves um as an investment that will pay in significant returns and we want to be a partner to our growing city. Um, our city cannot grow south, you know, unless it comes through, you know, Shaw. So mm -hmm. how might we partner, you know, in, you know, in, in, in expansion of our city boundaries by upgrading the infrastructure, um, et cetera, for Shaw. Mm -hmm. Shaw is very, very committed to the Southeast Raleigh community that has not seen the same kind of development right. as the city of Raleigh and North Hills, et cetera. So yeah. we're standing in the gap for that part of you know, our city as well, because we have a way of helping that voice be heard yes. and be able to bring all of our citizenry you know, into you know, the economic growth and development of the area. And we believe, you know, and, you know, don't want to sound boastful or anything. We believe that that is what Shaw's role is, what Shaw's calling is. And we are prepared to step into that space yeah. and lead through it. Um, and so, uh, and that's one of the exciting things about having Shaw Rising aired do during uh, Maryland Public TV celebration of HBCU Week is that we believe that we can be a model for mm -hmm. other HBCUs mm -hmm. in terms of how do you partner with your city uh, to be, you know, a a a a a growth uh, engine and a supporter and not. Um, I tell people all the time, you know, I don't want to be. Um, um, a, 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 a charity, you know, or, 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 you know, or, you know, oh my goodness, you know, poor Shaw. I want right. to be, uh, Shaw to be a partner in the growth engine of the city. And that requires investment, just like you invest in, um, commercial development, mm -hmm. you invest in, um, uh, Dick's Park to be, mm -hmm. you know, an incredible park for the future. Mm -hmm. That's what we're asking for Shaw. And we believe that uh, you will not be disappointed in what so we will be able to deliver. Let, let, let's, let's, let's put what you just said in the context of the $70 billion uh, Biden-Harris plan uh, for investment in HBCUs. Now, you just talked about the uniqueness of Shaw location, but also we see growth in cities we've seen this in america where there's a there there is a a schism between the haves and the have-nots you have uh wall street doing well main street suffering and then if you unpack that a little bit more in in urban and rural communities where hbcus are in the heart of many times the quote unquote black side of town or the black community uh, we see development hasn't necessarily kept pace so do you see the Biden-Harris $70 billion plan being a possible jumpstart of getting investment dollars from the federal government to HBCUs for infrastructure and, and hopefully further development? Is that what you're hoping for? Uh, uh, certainly, uh, we, we have high hopes for, um, for the uh, $70 billion investment uh, that is uh, the promise of the Biden-Harris a um, um, uh, 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 platform, mm -hmm. um, and in that seventy billion includes uh, doubling the Pell Grant uh, because many of our students, you know, are um, are Pell eligible and mm -hmm. um, and they have um, uh, low uh, EFCs, and so uh, their ability to go to college requires that they borrow money or work two or three jobs. And so doubling pale, uh, being able to make funding available for infrastructure upgrades, uh, because COVID showed us that when we went to the digital platform, many, many of our communities 
um, did not have the access to the technology to continue to have an education. So certainly the infrastructure piece of that is going to be uh, important. Uh, for our research um, institutions, um, uh, the investment in centers of excellence is going to be um, you know, amazing. Um, um, but I think that in the plan that we're talking about for Shaw, we will certainly benefit from the 70 uh, billion. Um, and that's for HBCUs and minority serving sure. institutions. Mm -hmm. And so that's, uh, you know, that that 70 billion will be divided many, many ways. But I think that there are partnerships at the local level, you know, that um, that are, are, you know, what you say, you know, on the ground things that that we need to do um, with local, you know, mm -hmm. government as well. Mm -hmm. So happy about the 70 billion, mm -hmm. definitely a good investment, mm -hmm. but you know, there are, you know, developers here in Raleigh um, and I'm sure in Charlotte and other cities, you know, that we have to create the model of how you work with us across the, you know, the public private partnership mm -hmm. um, um, chasm. And I think it's very doable. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and some, you um, uh, uh, schools have done it more successfully than others. The smaller schools, it's a heavier lift. But I believe that um, in any good investment, I'm going to put something in. I want something mm -hmm. out. Right. We both benefit. And that's the model that Shaw is, is working towards. And our students benefit because what greater classroom is there than mm -hmm. actually uh, applying your content um, in an area within walking distance, you know, of where you go to school and where you live. Um, and that's important because if college students work um, in uh, low wage jobs not associated with the major or their subject area of interest. Um, you work long hours for low wage because you need to supplement your income. Mm -hmm. But imagine if you could work fewer hours at an industry for which you are a contributor. Right. Then both win. Yes. And that's the model that Shaw believes that will work for Raleigh, for Southeast Raleigh, um, um, entrepreneurship in, in our communities, development. Um, and so we want to work with 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 our partners, um, you know, to to make this, you know, a, a model that can be replicated across the country. Um, and I think that. You know, when we talk about the new normal and post COVID, these are the kind of things that we're going to have to do to move our country forward oh, right. after, you know, such a devastating period, you know, of, of the COVID-19 pandemic that's still not yet over. So, so you talked about Shaw as a, a model and, you know, I could go on and on asking you these questions, but I promised to get our audience in and I can see they're <laughs> chomping at the bit to ask you questions. So the, one of the first questions is about Morris Brown and what could Morris Brown College in Atlanta take away from the turnaround at Shaw um, or, or is it too late? And for our viewers who joined us, Morris Brown, I think it was 2003, lost accreditation. Um, a, a historically black college in Atlanta, uh, plummeted to about 50 students. And as of late, I think they have a provisional uh, reacceptance uh, uh, into uh, SACS accreditation, I believe it is. Um, I, I'm actually, Travis, they, uh, they, they're going with an alternative accreditation body uh, called the TRACS. TRACS, um, okay. Yeah, the TRACS. Um, and so they, uh, they're uh, application um, has been um, accepted, as I understand, 
And so now they will undergo the process of, of seeking um, accreditation through TRAPS, which would permit their students to receive federal financial aid, uh, which uh, very few students uh, that attend our schools can go to school without the benefit of uh, access to, 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 to federal aid. Um, and so, uh, so that's step number one. Now, um, now, now uh, Morris Brown is nestled between Morehouse and Spelman and Clark Atlanta. Uh, what is it that they could borrow from the model that you laid out um, as they're trying to rebound? What what can Morris Brown do to regain its footing in the city of Atlanta? What what will be your recommendations? Um, once again, uh, my hands are full um, and my head is full uh, trying to keep um, uh, Shaw on its uh, visionary uh, track. Uh, but I believe that the um, um, Atlanta University Center model mm -hmm. would um, uh, to include Morris Brown in that model, mm -hmm. uh, you know, might be a pathway uh, because uh, those of us that have been continuously operating are challenged right now in this higher ed environment. Um, and so uh, many, many uh, institutions are merging Mm -hmm. um, and finding their path forward um, in, in, in these kinds of, of partnerships and collaboration. Um, and so it may be that um, a, a thoughtful way would be with some kind of um, engagement with the AU Center, you mm -hmm. know, as they began to, to rebuild um, on their, their, their pathway uh, back. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I never uh, uh, consider a, a, an HBCU down and out until it's down and out. Right. Um, and right. So, you know, I certainly, um, you know, um, you know, take my hat off to them and um, and, um, you know, anything that, you know, we're, we're 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 one big happy family. So we like to see, you know, each other, you know, succeed. Um, yes. And so we certainly have that that wish and desire for Morris Brown, but it, it, it's a tough road to hoe right. um, as an HBCU, you know, period. Right. And so that lift it, it is pretty significant, but, um, but you know, you know, they're doing um, everything within um, their power to turn um, the situation around. So, so there's another question here before we go to uh, zone opportunities. I'm, I'm going to ask if we can can go to the next question and come back to zone opportunities. Let's stick with this collaboration. Uh, you talked about a prescription for Morris Brown. So the question is, with a collaborative effort between Shaw, St. Augustine's, North Carolina Central Universities to raise funds and improve curriculum to create a higher demand for collaborative programs, what what, what kind of what kind of collaborative things could could happen between the three major HBCUs? And are there already uh, collaborative efforts that we might not know about. I know that there's the business incubator uh, in Southeast Raleigh, I think that was a collaboration between St. Augustine's and Shaw. Could you share with us what type of collaborations may be happening in the triangle between HBCUs? Um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that that's, uh, you know, a tough one um, uh, because we, uh, St. Augustine's and Shaw, you know, we are what, five miles apart? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, this past uh, year pre-COVID, um, we formed a, 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 a partnership via an MOU for us to um, utilize their sports stadium. And so instead of, you know, Shaw building facilities or going to Durham County Stadium to play football, et cetera, we partnered with St. Augustine's you know, to utilize their facility, you know, when they're away, we're at home and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, we are also, St. Augustine's and Shaw are part of a consortium called the Cooperating Raleigh Colleges. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that allows St. Augustine's and Shaw, along with William Peace and Meredith and NC State, and Wake Technical Community College mm -hmm. to do cross-registration, 
where where we don't if if we don't have but a few students in a class, um, and Meredith or Saint Aug has you know space in their class, my students can go there, but they register at their home campus. Mm -hmm. They are not charged by the other institution. And because we are physically so close together, that cooperative works very, very well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it expands the offering beyond just the HBCU community, um, uh, but it achieves uh, very much a similar kind of, um, you know, of, 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 of opportunity for us. Now, when it comes to uh, North Carolina Central, um, it's more a, um, we have uh, articulation agreements where you can start at one school and finish at the other. And so we have those kinds of initiatives going on, um, but we don't yet have an AU Center type model you know, that I'm not saying that sometime in the future that wouldn't make sense. Um, uh, but I think the cooperating Raleigh Colleges model works very, very well for Raleigh because the proximity of the institutions are so close mm -hmm. and our students get the opportunity mm -hmm. uh, to experience all of these campus environments and resources that we would not be able to afford, you know, on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. And a student at NC State, you know, or, you know, Meredith or one of the other schools could have the HBCU experience right, right. to some extent, yeah. you know, by virtue of the fact that we do have this, uh, this model. And I think it is probably one of the most successful consortiums of that nature that exists anywhere in the nation. Um, well, and so far that has worked well. Um, and we're always looking for ways uh, that we can collaborate uh, more so. Um, um, but, but sometimes you have to look at what is the, the focus and the mission and the strengths of each of the programs as you try to decide you know, how do you build these these um, collaborations? But we are open. St. Augustine's and Shaw talk all the time about some of our uh, front office functions, um, some of those things that could easily be done, you know, at one of the other places. And then we focus our resources on those things that are unique, you know, to our campuses. Uh, but we, we're having those discussions, and if the opportunity presents itself, I, I, I would certainly say from Shaw's perspective, we are open. So I'm going to try to move us along on a couple of rapid fire questions to make sure that your audience uh, doesn't feel disappointed that their questions were not asked. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, follow this up with a question about you seeing Shaw as a multicultural school. And I, I think um the question on the multicultural school situation is that people may not know when they hear historically black college what that really means and i know you have a lot of international students and and just because your skin color may be black does not mean that people identify as african american so could you explain the multiculturalism that shaw actually has for our audience uh, shaw has always been multicultural um, and uh, and 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 uh, Shaw uh, uh, probably um, you know has had um, you know a uniquely uh, diversified you know campus, mm -hmm. um, and in fact um, you know that's one of our strategic priorities is to make sure that uh, that our campus reflects more of the environment in which our students will be uh, exposed to. Um, and so we have international students. So we um, we introduce um, men and women soccer teams, mm -hmm. you know, to our sports lineup, so mm -hmm. that we could expand um, the number of, of students uh, that attend Shaw um, uh, uh, that would prefer to play soccer. And yes. so we attracted a larger um, 
Latin population mm -hmm. and uh, European population, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and uh, the Caribbean, you know, mm -hmm. to play, you know, soccer. Mm -hmm. You have a significant um, in addition uh, to, Middle Eastern population as well, right? Right, and um, um, and we uh, we have an international studies uh, 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 center, you know, that um, that has attracted, you know, a large uh, Middle Eastern uh, population, not nearly as large as it used to be, but certainly uh, we consider ourselves, you know, uh, quite multicultural, and in fact. Um, if you look at the blend of not only our students, but our faculty and staff as well, um, I, I'd say that, you know, we, we, we've been doing that for, you know, for, for a while. So let's talk about the next question. Um, I think it's above my uh, pay grade here. Uh, don't, Dr. Dillard, you have an MBA, is that right, from, uh, from, from, from Clark? Is that, is that correct? Is it the MBA from Clark? Uh, actually, uh, my MBA is from my one PWI uh, okay. educational experience. Uh, and, so and where, I, have a, I have an MBA from the Jack Massey School of Business in, um, um, in, at Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, so, great. So, so you're perfectly qualified to ask this, answer this next question. I'm just reading it to you. And uh, okay. if you put it on the screen, it's, the, it's talking about taking advantage of opportunity zone investments. And I think it's probably important for you to kind of to share this because you mentioned to me in several conversations about the value of Shaw's property um, in downtown Raleigh and how you were trying to leverage that. So what, how do you take advantage of opportunities on investments? What are they and, and uh, what, what, how does this help you hold on and leverage the property that you already have? Oh, great question, um, uh, Travis. And um, uh, Shaw does sit in an opportunity zone. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it is one that the uh, the governor designated for the state, and so mm -hmm. uh, so we exist in one. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Shaw commissioned a um, advisory panel through the Urban Land Institute a mm -hmm. year ago mm -hmm. to determine how we might leverage our location in an opportunity zone for the long term benefit of the university. Mm -hmm. And I will say I have been in a number of meetings and discussions about how to um, to leverage uh, the Opportunity Zone investment. Um, mm -hmm. And so far, um, you know, we've looked at uh, a number of possibilities um, and my board and I are, are, are trying to determine um, we know from the investor side of the house, you know, how um, how they benefit, mm -hmm. you know, by the um, the 10 year uh, deferment of capital gains taxes by investing. But at the end of the day, it's still, um, you know, a return on an investment in something that will live on once, you know, the. Uh, the investor pulls their capital out of um, of, of, of the venture. And mm -hmm. so we have been very cautious about, you know, creating something that will live beyond the 10 years or become such an, a lucrative investment from, from one of these Opportunity Zone funds that the funds stay in for the long-term benefit of an entity, and we've looked at things like um, uh, being a a five G um, um, six G provider, you know, for uh, the southeastern part of our city. Um, and so we 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 are definitely um, deep into exploration of mm -hmm. how we might benefit from the fact that we do sit in an opportunity zone. Uh, but there are people smarter than I that are still struggling with what does it really mean? Uh, and it was one of those um, uh, pieces of legislation that was enacted and then almost a year later trying to make the rules on how it would work. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's there's still much to be uh, uh, figured out, but it is high on our radar screen. I know all about it. I know 
the funds that are available. Um, and we've had many, many discussions. Uh, and, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that, that we will be able to take advantage of the fact that uh, we are in an opportunity zone. Thank, thank you for unpacking that and explaining that. Um, one of the questions was about building coalitions, but I think you you kind of answered uh, the questions of, of building coalitions. Um, I, I would ask it this way. Um, in addition to the financial support, what other ways do you need alumni support? How can Shaw alums help you advance your vision? And then we'll have one final question, uh, Dr. Dillard. You've been so fantastic tonight, um, but really, uh, we really want to know what can alumni do to support your vision? Uh, the number one thing that alumni can do is do what you're doing, mm -hmm. telling the Shaw story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because um, and, and, and sharing the experience that they had at Shaw. Mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. um, individuals, companies, et cetera, um, invest in people mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. invest in, um, in, in, in um, ideas and, uh, and opportunities where they can make a significant difference. Mm -hmm. And so we have great alumni. Mm -hmm. They love Shaw mm -hmm. and they do you know, everything they can do um, from a financial perspective. Yes, they could do more. Um, mm -hmm. And we, you know, uh, and each year we get a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But if you tell the Shaw story, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, if you, you know, come back and say, you know, I'm going to mentor or I'm going to um, support a student through Shaw, uh, that otherwise would fall through the cracks. You know, mm -hmm. those those are the kind of things that only alumni can do and do well. Mm -hmm. And I would tell you, Shaw's got great, you know, mm -hmm. alumni. Mm -hmm. You know, they when we call, they, they are there. <laughs> they answer. When yeah. we say, yeah. you know, I've got five students that are homeless. Um, I've got five students who, you know, you know, are being evicted. I have students whose um, whose parents, you know, are ill and they don't know what they're going to do. I will have a response within moments of wow. the ask. And wow. so I just tell my alums, you know, everybody doesn't know the story. Yes. Um, and you think because you had the experience, everybody knows about Shaw, yes. but they don't. And you have to tell them. Yes. You know, about, you know, the incredible story um, um, of Shaw University. And when I hear the incredible stories people tell about how Shaw made the difference, um, you know, in, in their uh, uh, living experience, you know, I am even more convinced, you know, that Shaw will be here another 55 years, 155 years to keep yeah. making it. Well, I, I, I want to accept the challenge. I'm going to ask our team if they could post in the chat. I posted during the earlier portion of Shaw Rising's film in the chat, in the chat a link to a piece that I wrote called Why HBCUs Matter. And in that piece, I talked about growing up on Shaw's campus and all those who inspired me. And, uh, and then there's a saying in the movie that one of my favorite sayings by uh, Reverend Dr. David Forbes, where he really says, no, Shaw, no student nonviolent coordinating committee or no SNCC, no SNCC, no Civil Rights Act, no Voting Rights Act, no Obama. And it's that spirit of social justice leadership at, that was uh, permeated the Shaw campus that that I ingested. And some people may say, oh, you're a Shaw graduate. Well, uh, I'm a bear, but I ended up going away from Raleigh and I came here to Baltimore to Morgan State University or the Morgan State University, but it's all the family uh, and the HBCU experiences that I've had. I share in the chat if uh, if they can post it for people to see. And I, and I want to leave you uh, with one final question. There may be parents watching. There may be students listening to you. There may be people who are curious who never heard the HBCU story. 
And so I want you to explain to that parent or that student, hearing from the president of an HBCU, why an HBCU experience would be beneficial to a student trying to make a college decision. What would you say? I would say this, there, there's, there's a college for, for every student. Mm -hmm. um, but if you've got a student, you know, that is, you know that the school system um, that they um, attended from K through 12 was not, you know, well resourced. Um, if you know that um, that in order for your student to be at the level to excel, then you want to put them in the environment where they will get that foundation and that nurturing um, and not be um, in a position where uh, they face their first failure. And that is the barrier that prevents them from ever completing their education. Um, and so parents, you know your child. If, if, if your child is, you know, can can survive anywhere um, and, and you've been able to, to make sure that they have, you know, that great, you know, foundation, they come to the HBCU to help even lift up that confidence um, and get an opportunity to see um, uh, people who look just like them and uh, and have an opportunity that maybe they didn't have as they were going through K through 12. Uh, so what Shaw University provides is those that need a little bit more support um, and foundational work in order to um, excel. You know, we take those and, and we do what we have to do to get them up to par. If you have one that you know, has run up against a roadblock um, and been knocked down, you know, um, you know, send them to Shaw, we can fix them, you know. So we're in the business of, you know, fixing those that may have been wounded, um, you know, from having an experience where they weren't readily accepted. Yeah. Um, and so, so the HBCU experience is there for a unique group of students. Mm -hmm. You know, who need to find a voice, mm -hmm. you know, who needs to determine, you know, you know, can I really do this? Um, mm -hmm. Because many of, of, of our students suffer from imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. You know, they did well in this environment, but they are fearful that they can do well in um, any environment. And so HBCUs are uniquely able to provide a quality education, um, but we do that also, as I started with my initial comments, by also knowing the individual student yes. and being able to interface in a way that might not easily happen, you know, at um, a, a larger um, or a PWI where they don't have those connections. And, and there, we and believe many, that there's a, a university for everybody, but, um, but Shaw is special. And, and um, let, me, let, me, let me just say this, and I want you to have the last word here to finish your thoughts, but there are a lot of honor students and AP students, as uh, we have discussed over the years. Uh, my daughter was one, I was one who were in many times hostile environments as, as one of two or three in AP courses. And that kind of does something to you uh, when you are in a hostile environment. I was one of the first students bust in Wake County. My uncle was Shaw grad, Shaw Board of Trustees who helped to integrate the public schools. And so when I was bused from Southeast Raleigh to another part of town, I didn't think that the school I was going to was adding anything to me. I thought I was bringing some pepper to the, 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 the environment and, and it needed it. But when you're in that environment over a 12 year period, it can be a little bit traumatic. So coming home to an HBCU also reinforces that you're in a safe space to be who you are. 
And exactly. so final words, Dr. Dillard, about the HBCU experience. These people have been hanging on to your words. I thank you for all of your time. I want to give you another 30 seconds just to say goodbye, say your last, the last appeal you could make as the president of the great Shaw University. I would say this, um, HBCUs are a vital part of the fabric of our nation. Um, and when we think about um, uh, doctors and nurses and uh, this pandemic and judges and politicians, uh, please know that the majority of those are educated at HBCUs. Uh, and so don't buy into your child cannot have a quality education at an HBCU because although we make up 9% of four-year schools, we graduate 24% of black undergraduates. We award 26% of all black baccalaureate degrees and 32% of STEM degrees that are earned by black students are earned at HBCUs. And they go on to work anywhere that they have the desire to work. And young women, 46% of black women who earn STEM degrees earn them. They graduate from HBCUs. So, you know, we got the track record, we're turning them out. Um, Vice President elect uh, um, Kamala Harris is an example. So, you know, um, I'm telling you, you know, take a look. We, we, we have the track record. We've been turning out success stories for as long as we have been in existence. And for Shaw, that's 155 years. Thank you for this opportunity to tell the Shaw story. And happy birthday, Shaw University. I want to thank you, Dr. Dillard. I want to thank all of our special participants tonight. I want to thank the MPT events team, the outreach team, the entire MPT family, the entire Shaw University family. Happy anniversary. Happy birthday, Shaw University. Thank you all so much for tuning in and supporting HBCU Week in Maryland and in the nation. And have a very wonderful and great evening. Good night.